100 years ago, what was the leading cause of death in the United States? Well, here are the top four. Pneumonia, influenza, tuberculosis, and diarrhea. Diarrhea? Yes, from cholera and intestinal parasites from drinking polluted water. Well, in the developed world today, no healthy person expects to die from these diseases. Why not? Well, inventions like vaccines, discoveries like antibiotics, public health education, and public works like uh, sanitation and water treatment. But if you could go back 100 years and interview people back in the early 20th century and say, do you think that people will, a lot of people will die from these epidemics? They'd probably shrug their shoulders and say, well, of course. I mean, what can you do? But we tamed those epidemics, didn't we? Well, what if fighting and violence were like that and we just didn't know it? What if we could prevent epidemics of fighting and violence or at least drastically reduce their negative effects? Well, it's not conflict that's the problem. I want to emphasize that. Conflict is a lot like fire. It has a dual nature. On the one hand, if you've witnessed an out-of-control house fire, building fire, you know how terribly destructive fire can be. On the other hand, we humans are the only animal species that controls fire. And it's what makes civilization possible. So it's not conflict itself that's the problem. And contrary, perhaps, to the suggestion in the title of my talk, it doesn't inevitably need to be busted. Constructive conflict, in fact, can surface problems. It can bring people together in common cause. It can clarify goals and beliefs. And it can promote individual growth and collective social change. On the other hand, conflict can destroy people and relationships and disrupt communities. And so really, it's the destructive conflict that needs to be busted. Well, I'm an urban sociologist. When I moved to Fort Wayne about 30 years ago, I was pleasantly surprised to find that there were over 100 neighborhood associations, most of them at least somewhat active. Given my longstanding interest in the study of community, I joined my neighborhood association board and served on it for nine years. Well, we did the usual things that these boards do, sponsored community potlucks, summer picnics, association-wide garage sales. But we also fielded calls and complaints from neighborhood residents. You need to do something about my neighbor. What are you going to do about them? They park their car in front of my yard. They don't mow their lawn often enough. They have that tree that drops fruit and leaves in my yard. What are you going to do about that? Of course, we'd always say to them, did you talk with your neighbor? Now, to people in the know, by the way, these kinds of problems, and people in the know now includes all of you, because I'm about to tell you, these kinds of problems are called very famously the barking dog problems. Or in the case of the beagle, I guess, the howling dog problems. Because they most frequently did involve barking dogs. My neighbor's dog barks all the time. You need to stop that dog from barking. Or they let it out in the middle of the night, and it barks and barks to come in and wakes us all up. Stop it. And when we said, did you talk to them, they'd always say, no, you can't talk to that knucklehead. You know, they won't listen. I just called the police. Or I just called the city and filed a complaint. Well, the police can come out, of course. But if they don't actually witness a crime being com committed, there's nothing they can do. And most of the things that neighbors complained about, in truth, were not really violations of city ordinances or neighborhood codes. So the police were frustrated. The city officials were frustrated. The residents were certainly frustrated. And we on the board were frustrated. I knew there had to be a better way. So I looked around, and I found it. Community mediation. Now, community mediation has been around for about 40 years. It's a process of structured dialogue between uh, the parties in a dispute mediated by trained volunteers. The trained volunteers are 
neutral facilitators. They're what William Urey, one of the founders of the Harvard Negotiation Project, calls the third side. Not an advocate for either party, not a judge, not an arbitrator, but a neutral facilitator. They truly are the destructive conflict busters, and they're who you need to call. Well, the mediators are not there to solve the disputant's problems for them. Rather, they're there to empower the disputants to discover and develop their capacities to solve their own problems. And through the discovery of common ground, to transform the relationship between them in a positive way. The goal is for a triple win. A win for each of the parties in terms of their underlying interests, and a win for the community as a whole in terms of increased livability and peacefulness. Now in the mediation process, the mediators encourage the parties in the dispute to tell their story. First of all to the mediators, and then to each other. Through using active listening techniques, which include restating, that is, restating the facts as they're discovered, reflecting underlying emotions, and summarizing new understandings and common ground as it's established, they ensure that the parties feel heard. By deep listening, they encourage the parties to find their voices and tell their stories. Now, why is storytelling important? Well, we humans evolved as storytellers. For several million years, while the human species has lived on the earth before the invention of writing, it was the only way to pass on culture, to tell stories. This is a Paleolithic cave painting, perhaps 10,000 years old. Yes, it shows the hunt, but more importantly, it shows the storytelling about the hunt. The way that people passed on knowledge and skills and myths and legends and beliefs and perspectives. Well, the invention of writing, of course, has provided other ways of telling stories, but we're still compelled by stories, right? We still enjoy good stories today. And we engage in storytelling, whether it's around the campfire or whether it's around the table sharing office gossip. But storytelling is crucial to the mediation process. Because storytelling encourages perspective taking. Well, I never knew you saw it that way. I just assumed something else. Storytelling also stimulates empathy. Well, I can understand how you'd feel that way now. I want to distinguish empathy from sympathy because the two are often confused in the popular mind, I think. Sympathy is when you feel bad for somebody. Oh, that poor person. I feel so bad for them. Whereas empathy is putting yourself in someone else's shoes. I feel your pain. Storytelling also encourages the discovery of new possibilities. The goal is not compromise, meeting in the middle, which we're often taught is the solution to everything. Let's just meet in the middle. Let's divide it in half. But rather, it's about collaborative problem solving in a context of enlarged possibilities. Now, interestingly enough, these are the same skills we need for democratic dialogue. Talking to each other about really important things. Consider these three phrases. Talking at, talking to, and talking with. Talking at is what most of talk radio and indeed political speeches are. The speaker has no intention of listening, right? They're just declarative in nature. This is what you should think. This is how you should feel. Talking to is sharing information, like in a lecture, like in what I'm doing right now. Talking with, on the other hand, is a mutual exchange of perspectives, of ideas. And when we engage in these kinds of uh, behaviors, we can come closer to the achievement of democracy. Now, imagine that we had centers or public spaces in our neighborhoods where we could learn and practice these skills, where we could talk with one another to peacefully resolve conflicts, to 
discover common ground that we have, and to respectfully acknowledge differences. These kinds of places are called third places. Not home, not work, somewhere neutral, but shared. And these third places are forums for the third side. Now, these places would, of course, look different in different kinds of neighborhoods. In some neighborhoods, they may be drop-in storefront community centers. In other neighborhoods, they might take the form of expanded bus huts. This is a design a colleague and I did for an international design competition. It's an expanded bus hunt that's available for four season use. Why? Because there are solar collectors on the roof and wind turbines nearby that provide heating and cooling as needed. But what's more important about this is there's lots of seating, permanent tables for playing dominoes, cards, checkers, chess, writing a letter. People still do that or getting on your iPad. Um, but more than just a place to wait for the bus, it's a place to hang out, a place to talk with your neighbors, to catch up on the neighborhood gossip, to exchange points of view on current issues, to learn other people's stories, a place to build community. In other neighborhoods, it might take the form of coffee houses or cafes. This is a, a cafe in, uh, or uh, more than a cafe, in a Central City neighborhood in New Orleans appropriately named Café Reconcile, the Reconciliation Café. It's a community center. On the first floor, a café. On the upper floors, community mediation centers, community meeting places, community education. In other neighborhoods, perhaps the location would be uh, community shared tool sheds or shared toy sheds. But the form, of course, is not what's important. It's the process. The process of collaborative problem solving and democratic dialogue. You know, children born today are likely to be alive at the dawn of the 22nd century. It's amazing to think about, isn't it? Will our children and grandchildren look back at our times today with the same mixture of pity and sadness that we look back at those terrible epidemics of the early 20th century? Or will they look back at our times and say, that was the moment they got it. That's the moment they stemmed the epidemic of fighting and violence and restored democracy. Like the scientists and public officials of the previous century, we can use inventiveness, public education, and public works to build communities that are capacity enhancing, compelling, and collectively accountable. We can do this. Are you in? Thank you.